to remain standing out of honor of God's Word. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 18. It says in verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear then, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. We're going to pray together. And as we pray, we want to give thanks. Our mission team in Florida arrived safely. They'll be serving there this week at the children's home. So pray for them. Pray for Wanda Cinnamon. She's in the hospital having some tests today. Eddie Jones uh, went to the hospital last night. He's back home. So we want to pray for them. It's good to have uh, Lex with us. Lex is... Uh, Lex is in the reserves, and always good to see you. Thank you for serving, uh, and thank you all those who serve as Brother Ty and, and Julie and Jared and, and uh, Chris and, and all these who are... Uh, Josh, I'm sorry, Chris ain't serving yet, Josh. Uh, all these who are serving, we want to remember them. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for how you would challenge us through the message today. Thank you for a wonderful time of worship. Thank you for Israel and Debbie and Sue and the choir and for the worship team, and for those up in the booth, thank you for each of them who are faithfully serving you to lead us to worship you. Every song pointed to you, Jesus. And that last one is such a sweet message. Through the storm, you are Lord, Lord of all. No matter what we face, you are faithful. And we are thank you for, so thankful for the storm of death that you have overcome through your resurrection, through your death on the cross and that our righteousness is found in You, that we will be accepted by God because of the righteousness of Jesus applied to our lives. Thank You. Lord, we do pray for Wanda and for Eddie and others who are sick. Pray for those who have surgery this week. Lord, we ask You to be with them and protect them and, and care for them and bring healing. Lord, we pray for those You've sent out from our church to preach. Bless, bless each of them as they preach even now. Fill them with Your Holy Spirit. Anoint them, Lord. We pray a blessing. We pray, Father, for those who are serving in the military. We thank You for each of them. Thank You for their willingness to serve. For our missionaries, thank You for them. For our mission team in Florida, bless them and use them in a great way for Your glory. For those who will be baptized this evening at the river, bless them. Lord, just thank You. And now, Lord, as we come into Your presence, we pray Your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. Speak to us. We are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. I'm thankful for our choir. I invite you to join them this afternoon at 5 o'clock. They will have choir practice, and you're welcome to join them. We've got some new faces up here, and we invite you to join them. We are glad to have visitors and guests with us. Some, some of you brought your families today and you've invited folks to come and we're so glad you're here. We had a good number at our early service at 8 o'clock and uh, many of you are listening also on, on, on our website and so those who are listening online, we appreciate you listening and, and uh, wanting to hear God's Word. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're talking today, uh, continuing our series about navigating this world without becoming worldly as we study through 1 Corinthians. And we come to chapter 5, and chapter 5 is about accountability. I told the 8 o'clock service, chapter 5 is one that would have been really easy just to kind of skip on by and uh, not talk about because for four chapters, Paul has been addressing the church at Corinth, and he's been talking about the division in the church. Can you believe that there would actually be some division in a church? It's unbelievable, isn't it? That there would be any problems in a church. That, that just blows my mind that that would happen. But there was division in the first four chapters. He's been dealing with that because some of them were all about Paul and some were about Paulus and some were about Peter. And so there was some division. And so now he picks up in chapter 5 and he talks about not division but about discipline. And he's going to address an issue in chapter 5 about something that's happening in the church that needs to be addressed. And so we're talking today, if we want to navigate this world as followers of Jesus without becoming worldly, it requires some accountability. It requires people speaking into our lives truth in love. It requires people who love us enough that when we get off course... They're going to come into our life and they're going to say, you need to repent, you need to head in a different direction, you have gotten off course. And so it's really important that we have those in our life who are going to help us 
be accountable. And this chapter reminds us that as a body of believers, it is our responsibility to hold one another accountable. Individually, we need accountability partners. We need folks in our life who are going to help us and ask us those tough questions. But as a church also, if you're a member of Ridgeview, then there's some accountability. Mutual accountability as brothers and sisters. I meet with a group of five guys on Monday nights. We're studying a book together, and in the back of the book, there's some accountability questions. And we'll ask some of these questions uh, each week as we meet. So here's some accountability questions that you need somebody to be asking you these questions weekly in your life. Here they are. Have you spent time in the Word and in prayer this week? Have you shared the gospel or your testimony with an unbeliever this week? Have you spent quality time with your family this week? Have you viewed anything immoral this week? Have you had any lustful thoughts or tempting attitudes this week? Have you told any lies or half-truths to put yourself in a positive light before others? Have you participated in anything unethical this week? Have you lied about any of your answers today? So you need someone who will speak truth into your life because they love you. And so that's what this chapter is about, is some accountability. So look there in your, in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read 13 verses here, so just follow along on the screen or there in your Bibles. So Paul is writing, he says in verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Let's take a place at the church. There's a man in the church who is living together with his stepmom in a sexual relationship. And so that's what's taking place, a member of the church who's living in sin. And so he's going to address what should the church do when one of its members is living in public sin. Verse 2, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I was present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, and since that you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven or malice of wickedness and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he's dealing with the church to say, here's how you should handle when there's a member in the church who's living in public sin, who is rebellious, who won't repent. And then he picks up in verse 9, and he deals with what a different letter that he had sent to them, and they've misunderstood what he was saying. So in verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexual immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of this world. What he's saying here is, he's going to go on to say it in this other passage, is that when I told you not to hang out with, with people who are sinful and not to associate with them. I was talking about the believer who was living in sin. He says, I'm not talking about those who are lost. If you try to avoid everyone that's sinful, you will have to, you'll have to live in a bubble, right? You have to be sent off to Mars, or you have to be as a hermit, because we live in this world. But what he's saying is, we need to make friendships with those who are lost, because we need to bring them to Jesus. But for the Christian, for the believer who is living in sin, he says, you should not be associating with them. That's what he goes on to say. Look in verse 11. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or a viler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. I think he's talking about there also Lord's Supper. He says, if there is a known believer who is living in rebellious sin, I'm talking about public sin, then you should not be associating with them. Verse 12, For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? There's where he says, It's God who will judge. Verse 13, But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. He's talking about the brother who is living in sin. This is a uh, difficult chapter. And it's one that I would have avoided if I just uh, picked where I wanted to preach. 
But when you preach the whole counsel of God and you try to present it to God's people and you preach through a book, you're going to cover some things sometimes that, that are uncomfortable, that are not easy to address. But they are needful. God gave us all that's in this Word because we need it. Can you say amen? Amen. And we need to hear from what God is saying in chapter 5. We need accountability. We need individually people who are going to hold us accountable. We need people who are going to speak truth into our lives. That's from our youngest children up through the teenagers, to the college students, to the single adults, to the senior adults. You need people who are going to speak truth into your life. That when you get off course, if we're navigating this world without becoming worldly, we need some people who are going to speak truth to our lives when we get off course. In this passage, he's going to challenge us also as a church to see the importance of addressing sin in our church. This chapter goes along with with 2 Corinthians as well because it seems when you read in 2 Corinthians, this man who is uh, intimately involved with his stepmother, it seems that his father still probably is alive and involved in the church. It's interesting in chapter 5 because if you notice, he never speaks to the woman. He's only addressing the man. And so what you assume is the woman is not a member of the church, And possibly she's not even a believer. Now let me give you a sad commentary. It's a sad commentary when followers of Jesus are get off course, are drawn aside and get off the path that Jesus has for their life and live in sin, and the person that they're sinning with is an unbeliever. Do you know how, how sad that is? That instead of you and your life leading someone to Jesus, your life, you're there in sin with that unbeliever and you're pushing them further away from Jesus. It's a sad situation. I've seen it time and time again. The word that was used when I grew up was shacked up. You know, a man and woman living together, not being married. And I've seen it before where one's a believer and one's not. That believer, that is a terrible witness to that person that you're involved in sin with. And it seems to be the situation here. So the church is addressing the one that's a member of the church. Another sad commentary on our society is when I read verse 1, and I said that there's a man who's intimately involved with his stepmom, that didn't even surprise you. In our society today, Paul says here in verse 1, this is not even named among the Gentiles. He said this is so terrible, even the pagans don't do something like this. But yet the church is allowing it to take place. And and so he says to us today, it's a sad commentary because none of us even blushed at that. We're used to sin. We've become sensitized to sin. It's on our TVs. It's on our computer screens. It's on our phones. It's all around us. And so it's become normal for us. We've got used to sin. And so here he says even the pagans, they wouldn't do something like this. And so... It's a sad commentary in the society we live in that sin doesn't seem to bother us. Find your bulletin. On the back of your bulletin, you'll find our sermon notes, and it'll help you to guide you through this this difficult chapter, chapter 5, but also to kind of guide us in our time together. We're going to discover that if we're going to navigate this world without becoming worldly, it it is required that we have some accountability. Now, let me just clarify, when we talk about accountability and church discipline, we all admit up front that everybody in this sanctuary, we have our own struggles. Can you say amen to that? I mean, we all struggle. We, we got issues with our anger, we got issues with selfishness, we got issues with our thoughts, we got issues with, with being godly than thou, you know, we got issues about negative, we, we got issues. We all have them. And so, when I talk about church discipline, it's like this. Adrian Rogers always described it this way. He said, there's a big difference in walking along the pool and stumbling over the pool chair and falling into the water. Instead of, it's different than if you do a cannonball off the diving board. You understand what I'm saying? Us in here, we desire. Okay, I'm just saying most of us in here, our desire is we want to live for Jesus. We want to do the right thing, but sometimes we, we trip over the pool chair and we stumble and we struggle daily. We have our daily struggles. 
But there's a desire to want to honor God. But what we're talking about here that church discipline deals with is that blatant attitude of, I will not repent. That God had said, has said, this is sin, and yet you continue living in that sinful public lifestyle, disregard for what God says, and you continue doing, no matter when other people speak into your life, when the Word of God speaks into your life, when the Holy Spirit speaks into your life, and yet you continue to be stiff-necked and continue that you will not repent. That's who we're talking about in chapter 5, this attitude that I will not repent, that I'm not going to do what God would have me to do. And so that's doing a cannonball into the pool with this rebellious attitude. So look in your notes. What is it that God's Word tells us? How should the church handle sin in the church? How should we as individuals deal with sin in our lives? Well, three things he tells us that the church should never do. And they all come from this passage. And the first thing is the church should never... Ignore sin. If you want to fill in your blank, the first blank there is, is to ignore sin. This is the approach that many of us, uh, many of us and many churches will do with sin. They just ignore it. You ever been in the, in the grocery store and you see somebody at a distance that you know is going to want to talk to you for 30 minutes and you avoid them? I'm not saying I've ever done that now, okay? I would never do anything like that, you know. I, but have you ever done that? You ever wanted to avoid someone because you had, had to be somewhere and you couldn't talk, and so you, you avoided them? You went down a different aisle, you checked out a different register, I act like I know what I'm talking about, don't I? So you know, you, 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 you ever done that? Well, that's what we try to do with sin oftentimes. We ignore it, we avoid it, we don't talk about it. We sweep it under the rug. We hide it. That's what happens in the church oftentimes. We just ignore sin. Look the other way. Maybe nobody noticed. Second thing in your notes there, not only the church should never ignore sin, second of all, the church should never tolerate sin. We live in a world of political correctness. We live in a world that everybody should tolerate everything, that we should be tolerant. And the church has bought into this temptation that Satan has said to us, just learn to tolerate sin. So what happens, we keep sweeping sin under the rug in our family and in our lives and in our churches and we sweep it under the rug and we ignore it. And finally, uh, the, the pile gets so big that we begin to trip over it. And so we can't, we can't ignore it anymore. It's the elephant in the room and there it is. And, and so we know about it and we can't ignore it anymore so we learn to tolerate it. Well, I don't like it, you'd say, but I'll learn to tolerate it. I, I don't like it. But I, 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 I'll, I'll just uh, go along with it and I don't want to rock the boat and I don't want to say anything. I don't want to come across judging because, you know, I've got my own issues. And so we don't deal with it. And so we keep sweeping under the rug and then we trip over it and we, we say, well, we'll just kind of tolerate it. And one of the things we do is we try to justify it. We do this in our own lives and with our kids and our grandkids. We begin to justify it. Ten years ago, we would have very clearly said, yes, that is sin. But then when it starts to hit home or we're involved in it individually, then we begin to tolerate sin. We begin to justify it and say, well, it's not as bad as this one. It's not as bad as that sin. It's not as bad as that sin. And so we learn to tolerate sin. Third thing the church should never do is to accept sin. That's sort of the pattern of what happens. And that's what Paul is addressing in this passage. Corinth had begun to accept this sin. Phillips in his commentary described it this way. This man and... His stepmom, they're living together, and everybody in the church knows it. They ignored it for a while, and then they began to be tolerant with it, and then began to accept it. Now that, that man and his stepmom comes in the church, and, and people embrace them, and they feed them Lord's Supper, they serve them Lord's Supper, they let him sing in the choir, he's maybe even a deacon, you know, because maybe he's got money, or maybe he's a likable guy, and so we just learn to tolerate it, and we just learn to accept it. And so it's okay, you just come on in. And Paul says, what in the world's going on? Why are you just accepting this sin? I'm not even there, but I've already judged. You need to do something. This is wrong. We cannot be a people who are accepting sin, but that's what happens. Paul says you're even puffed up about it. You're even glorifying in it. Here's what happens. Church at Corinth put out on their sign, open-minded. We're accepting. We're non-judging. We're politically correct. 
You come on in. It doesn't matter how you want to live. It doesn't matter what you do. You're a member of our church. We're open-minded. We'll accept whatever. And so that's what Corinth was doing. They were bragging. They were feeling good about it. We're 21st century. I mean, we just accept everything. It don't matter what our members do. They can live anywhere they want to. And we're open-minded. And, and man, just you know, come on in. And so there's this, this prideful at, attitude, arrogance, that they were better than other people because they were accepting of sin. And Paul says, are you absolutely nuts? A church cannot be accepting of sin. Churches and denominations in our world today are doing like Corinth, and I pray that Ridgeview will never be that way, and I pray Southern Baptists will never be that way. They've become accepting. Same-sex marriage, come accepting for men and women to live together outside of marriage. They've become accepting of, of young people having sex before marriage. They've become accepting of, of homosexual lifestyle, and so they just say, we're open-minded it's okay, we just accept all of that. And God's saying all the well, you can't accept sin. To be a follower of Jesus, you've got to get people on the right course. And, and when they're off course, you've got to speak truth into their life. And so it's a slippery slope. When you begin to ignore sin, that leads to tolerating sin, and that leads to accepting sin in our lives, in our families, and in our churches. That is not what the church should be doing. But look in your notes there. Let's see what the church should be doing. Paul addresses it. He says, And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. In your blank there, the church should weep over sin. Paul says, instead of being prideful about how you're open-minded and how you're with the times and how you're accepting people in sin, you ought to be mourning over it. He calls out the people at Corinth and he says, why aren't you weeping over this guy instead of accepting him and his lifestyle? He's living in sin and yet there you are accepting it. He says, I'm calling you out. What you should be doing is you ought to be on your face on the altar weeping for this man because he's our brother and he's off course and he's heading in a way of destruction. Can I ask you a question? How long has it been since you have wept? over a brother or sister who's off course? How long has it been since you and I have wept over our sons and our daughters and our grandkids who have gotten off course? I'm telling you, chapter 5, it is very tempting for us to want to ignore their sin, tolerate their sin, and accept their sin. Now, I'm telling you in your family, you love them. Man, you never stop loving them. But moms and dads and grandparents, you better step up and speak truth into their life. Can you say amen? That's weak. Let me tell you. Say it again. Do you think you need to speak truth into your grandkids and your kids' life? Say amen. 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 We need to speak truth into their life and, and not accept the things they're doing. Love them. Embrace them. But say, listen, we need to talk about this. You're off course. And so we need to weep. Oh, may God break our hearts for our brothers and sisters who've gotten off course. Say a thing there in your passage. He says, He who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. The church should weed out sin. Now, this is where it gets a little uncomfortable. This is where it gets, maybe where a lot of you are going to not like what I say and you're going to disagree, but guess what? You're disagreeing with God, so you're on the bad end of this, okay? Paul says in the authority of Jesus Christ that if a brother or a sister who's a member of your church, if they're living in sin, Matthew chapter 18, God's Word says, when you see a brother sin, you go to that brother individually. So you look on social media and you see a member of our church saying something inappropriate, pictures out there inappropriate, posting things inappropriate, you private message them and you say to them, Hey, you know that what you put up? I know you probably didn't mean it like this, but that seems inappropriate for a follower of Christ. If they say, you know what, I'll take that down. End of the discussion. Nothing else to be done. If they say, it's none of your business. You don't tell me what I'm supposed to do. Well, then you're to take a brother or sister and you go to them and you say, hey, this is an issue. You're a bad witness in what you're doing. And man, we love you and we don't think you should. I don't care. It's not your business. 
Well, then eventually you reach out and you reach out in love and you reach out in love and if they continue to be, no, I'm not going to repent. No, I'm not going to turn from this. Then it comes to the church and the church is to deal with it. Let's say you see one of our members, he's out at lunch and he's with a woman that's not his wife and he's awful, awful friendly with this lady and so you privately go to him Say, hey, I'm just concerned. He says, well, it's my sister. Hey, that's great. End of the discussion, right? He says, well, that's my secretary. What about you see that woman at work and she's flirting with the other guys and she's married? You go to her privately and you say, hey, that, I'm just going to speak truth into you because I love you. I'm just concerned. If they take that and they say, you know what, you're right. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't mean that to be that way. Thank you. It's the end of the discussion. But if they are rebellious, they won't turn. You represent Jesus and you represent Ridgeview. And so Paul says, weed out sin. If there is someone that's a member of our church who is rebelliously living in sin turning away from God, and they've been addressed in a loving way, and they've been time after time after time approached, graciously reached out to, persuading them to repent, and they refuse, then Paul says they need to be removed from your body. A little leaven spreads like cancer, he says. Sin is contagious. If we ignore sin, we tolerate it, and accept it, it will spread throughout the body. We need to weed out sin. If they repent, then we rejoice because our brother and sister has been restored. This passage here reminds us that we need to be careful when there is a believer who's living in open public sin, we need to be careful about associating with them because when we associate with them, it's tempting for us to be drawn into that. When we associate with them, we're not allowing the discipline of God to take place. There needs to be some reality check for believers who are living in sin, there needs to be some reality that the body of Christ says to them, we're not going to support what you're doing because we love you too much and you need to return and you need to repent because you're going in a direction that's going to hurt you. I'll look in your notes before our time runs out. Look some things about church discipline. So we need to weep over sin and weed out sin. He says to remove that person if they won't repent. So he says church discipline is to be done in the power of Jesus' name. That's what it says there in verse 4, that you do it in the power of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, the authority comes in His name. Do you realize that Ridgeview Baptist Church is the body of Jesus? Can you say amen to that? That's His body. You're His body. And so He has the authority if there's a member of the body who is rebellious and who will not repent, he says, I want that removed. I don't want it to be part of this body. They need to have a reality check. They need to be, they need to be brought to a place to realize that the Holy Spirit is trying to convict them and bring them to discipline. So he says, listen, the authority comes in the name of Jesus. Second of all, church discipline is done for the protection of Jesus' name. Man, I don't know how many times. Dad, how many times you go visit somebody and, and he's trying to share the gospel with them, or you're trying to invite them to your church, and they say, hey, isn't no so-and-so a member of your church? When you hear that, you know what's coming, right? I work with those so-and-so, and he don't he go to your church? I know what's coming. They're going to call out how certain people who name the name of Jesus, certain preachers who name the name of Jesus, certain people who talk about their church, but they live like the world, and so they, it's a hindrance to sharing the gospel. You represent Jesus, you represent the name of Jesus, you represent the church, and so church discipline is done to protect the wonderful name of Jesus. The lost community is judging Jesus, and He's judging our church by its members. Last two things that are noticed in your, in your bulletin. Church discipline can lead to repentance. You ever drive up Carter's Valley up through here, and you meet somebody, and David, forgive me, uh, our policemen, forgive me. But you ever drive up through there and hey, people flash their lights? You ever done that? I know two or three things is going to happen up here. There's either a policeman sitting at the Methodist church, right? Or there's a cow on the road. Or there's a wreck. But some total stranger blinked his lights at me to warn me that there's something up here that's probably going to harm me. That's what church discipline is. That's what accountability is. 
It's flashing your lights at your brother and your sister and saying, hey, you're headed off course. Hey, there's something up here ahead. You're going to run your marriage. You're going to run your family. You're going to run your testimony. It's going to cost you. Flash your lights. But yet total strangers will warn me that most brothers and sisters, we won't take time to warn them. We won't take time to say, hey, you're headed in the wrong direction. But yet a total stranger will tell me something happening. But yet we won't do that for one another. We need some accountability. Accountability is done out of love. That's what this says. Church discipline can lead to repentance. When you do it out of love, you're doing speaking truth into their life in love. And you're saying, I love you. You're heading in the wrong direction. Can lead to repentance. And then the last thing in your notes there. Church discipline can lead to restoration. 2 Corinthians seems to be addressing this issue in chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to Him. It seems that this guy that we're reading about in chapter 5 come to a place of repentance. Turned back to the Lord, turned back away from the life he was living, and there seems to be some repentance, and that's what church discipline is all about. What if the church would have not practiced church discipline and just continued to accept the lifestyle he was living? He would have continued on that route, but because they loved him enough to hold him accountable, it says there, reaffirm your love to him. It is a beautiful picture, and I've seen it happen. When you practice church discipline, or you you call someone out on some things in their life, out of love, and God brings them to a place of repentance. God brings to a restoration, to see a marriage restored, to see a family restored, to see a church restored, to see homes restored and witness restored. What a wonderful thing it is. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. If we love one another, we're going to hold each other accountable. Find someone that will hold you accountable. Find someone who will speak into your life truth. Accountability starts with ourselves. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation, and this is an altar that you can come and pray. I wonder individually right now, personally, is there some sin in your life that you need to confess? Is there some sin in your life that the Holy Spirit is bringing? Maybe it's not public sin, but maybe it's some private sins. Maybe it's that anger. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's uh, lying. Maybe it's selfishness. I don't know what it is, but what if you were to come and to repent of that today and to be restored? And what about a brother or sister that God has brought to your mind that has gotten off course? What about somebody that maybe used to be right here in this church with you? What about somebody that used to be in your Sunday school class? Or what about a member of your family who have gotten off course? And they are rebellious to what God's will is for their life. What about during imitation? What if you came and prayed for them? What if you began to weep for them? I wonder what a difference it would make. If you're here and you're lost, repentance is the step for you for salvation. To confess you're a sinner to God. I've sinned against you, God. I believe, Jesus, you died for my sins, buried and rose again the third day, and I ask you to forgive me and to save me today. Repentance. We're saved by grace through faith. I pray you'd be saved. Stand with me for prayer. Heavenly Father, this is a very difficult chapter, but it's a chapter that we need to hear. Oh, how we need accountability in our lives. I'm thankful for men that you've brought into my life through the years who've held me accountable. I'm thankful for my wife, the Lord, who has faithfully been there to speak truth into my life and hold me accountable. Lord, I pray for those here today who maybe don't have people speaking truth into their lives. I pray that you would bring someone and put in their heart that they would seek out someone who would be accountability partner for them. For men, another man. For women, another woman. Lord, just bring someone into their lives. Help them to take the initiative to go and ask someone. And Lord, I pray that everyone in here, if there's sin in our life, that we would come confess it. And Lord, that we would get a burden and begin to weep over 
a brother or a sister who are li living in sin and who are rebellious, may we weep over them. Not be accepting or ignoring or tolerant, but may we weep. And Lord, help us as a church that we would do better in this area of speaking truth into people's lives. And Lord, there's been so many times when we've dropped the ball and so many times that I've dropped the ball and I have failed. Give us boldness and courage that we will speak truth in love into the lives of those who get off course. Lord, for those who are lost, we pray you would draw them to you. And they would be saved this day. We pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Just keep your heads bowed.